Do you remember March of 2020? It was either yesterday or three years ago, depending on how you think about this. But we had this little pandemic thing, and someone asked me, what can we do to help the National Health Service of England in this difficult time? And I said, I don't really have free time, but maybe I can hang out with them daily and tell them about what the threat landscape looks like and how to harden their network. And my CVP said, that sounds fantastic. Um, so uh, I have developed a wonderful relationship with our friends at the NHS in th sharing threat intelligence and helping them harden their networks. They are now going to share their knowledge of threat intelligence with you and how they've applied it, specifically related to a piece of malware called Quackbot or Qbot, depending who, are you, who you are. I introduce you to Dan and Ben. Good morning. That's very much my lifeline over there. <laughs> so good morning, and thank you very much for having us. As Jessica mentioned, we're, we've flown in from the NHS in England to talk a little bit about our experience, a bit about the NHS, a bit about Quackbot, and why that and its contemporaries pose such an acute threat to, to networks such as ours. And earlier on today, Jessica, I think, Sensing some nerves, perhaps, in us standing up here um, in front of a room of incredible experts like yourselves. Gave me some advice. And she said, just be charming and British and you'll be fine. And I, <laughs> I guarantee we will be British. <laughs> so, <laughs> bit of disclosure, the actual full title of this talk was originally Hunting Quackbot Across the World's Largest Microsoft Defender for Endpoint Tenant, an NHS story. It's been corrected on the screen because we don't know we actually have the world's largest NHS MDE tenant. But it's really big, and nobody corrected us until we got here. So we'll, we'll roll with it for the time being. <laughs> Additionally, you may notice throughout the talk that we refer to Quackbot, Qbot, Pink Slip Bot, a number of different names interchangeably throughout the talk, for which we apologize, but just bear with us. So briefly, who are we? So I'm Dan Taylor. So I'm the Principal Threat Intelligence Analyst for the NHS CSOC, part of NHS England. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Ben McGee, who heads up our threat hunting function. Let's talk a little bit about the CSOC. In a sentence, the CSOC is a centralised security operations capability located in NHS England, providing security services to healthcare organisations across the NHS in England. That's a bit of a distinction we'll get to in a few slides' time. But that's the, the key thing you need to know when we're referring to the CSOC, because it's a term that's used all over the place. That's, that's who we are. So, short history of us, and as Jessica mentioned, when we first kind of met, uh, formed that relationship in 2020, Back in the house in days of 2017, before a lot of stuff happened, we were a team of about six, formerly known as CareCert, before we formally formed the CSOC at the time. And then in May of 2017, WannaCry happened. People undoubtedly be familiar with WannaCry and the absolute havoc it caused, but in the UK, that havoc was felt nowhere more keenly than across healthcare. Hundreds of individual organisations were affected. Our ability to deliver critical health and care was adversely affected. That was something of a watershed moment for cybersecurity in the NHS. It was a wake-up call in a number of ways. And one of, the, one of the many things that then happened out of the, the kind of follow-on, the fallout of that event, was that CareCert then became CSOC. It was decided that we would grow, the capability would grow. We need the decentralised security capability to support healthcare organisations across the service. Fast forward a few years, capability grows, manpower grows, we get more staff, we get more capability, we try to better support the, the large healthcare service that we're, we're a part of. Then in 2019, something happened with a bat. And then in 2020, I couldn't buy Lou Roll for a little while. Pandemic kicks off. First UK lockdown is in March 2020. A few months later, it was decided we was going to build a dedicated security operations centre alongside the CSOC called the CDOC, Cyber Defence Operations Centre. Branding was a nightmare. But it was a dedicated cyber security operations centre specifically for the COVID-19 response. So as many countries will undoubtedly uh, experience for things like test, trace, contain, all, all those aspects of the response. Needed infrastructure. Much of it was built very quickly. Most of it lived in the cloud. We needed it like protective monitoring delivered to that. So we built a dedicated SOC known as the CDOC. Could be a talk all of its own. We built it in about eight months. It was a bit of a journey. It was an interesting uh, experience that we had. But then in 2021, after the CDOC had been running for a while, we entered what we call Project Fusion. That had two primary objectives. First one, we were going to integrate CDOC into CSOC. We we're going to absorb into the mothership all of the capability, all of the expertise we've developed, and bring that across into the CSOC for the betterment of the whole of the National Health Service. The secondary objective of Project Fusion was to use that as a catalyst to then re-architect the entire CSOC. So up until now, since 2017, we've been growing the capability in size. 
this was an opportunity to shake the whole thing up, rebuild it from the ground up with a generous amount of help from our friends at the NCSC in the UK. In the, inter in the years in between, we continue to grow those capabilities. We're now a team closer to 60 than six, um, and we continue to provide those services and, and expand as we move forward. So what is it we do in the CSOC? Anyone who's ever worked in a SOC or with a SOC will be familiar with most of these things, but most of the services we deliver can be categorized in one of four primary categories. Protective monitoring is very much the beating heart of what we deliver out of a SOC. That kind of responding to alerts, the identification of malicious activity, raising those incidents, and identifying that malicious um, behavior. The key way that we interact with organizations in the National Health Service is via national services. So within the NHS, there are thousands of independent organizations ranging from GP, individual GP surgeries, all the way to hospitals and organizations spanning multiple healthcare organizations with hundreds of employees. The way that we interact with them as a kind of a leverage centralized SOC is that there are a number of center, kind of national services delivered that organizations could opt in for. For example, we have a dedicated private network called the Health and Social Care Network. We have something called Secure Boundary, which is something that's like a national firewall that organizations could opt in for. And we deliver our services to those services. And so when they enroll, they get the benefit of our services straight out at the gate. Secondly, incident support. So the other side of protective monitoring, what do you do when you find that? What are we actually going to do to kind of bring these things to fruition? We have a dedicated incident management function. We have a number of CIR retainers that we maintain. So we have this centralized pool of resource and expertise that we provide to these organizations. Because as I mentioned, the level of maturity and the size and resource available to those organizations varies dramatically depending on who they are. At the pointy end of the CSOC spear, we also have threat hunting. So Ben and his team, they've been part of a, a growing um, kind of area of focus for the CSOC. Proactively identifying those threats, going out of our way to find the stuff that we're not otherwise alerting on. How can we proactively find the bad? Um, and, and also acting as one of the primary sources of detection generation in the CSOC. So most of our detections across Microsoft Defender for Endpoint and our other tooling can find its roots in the work done by the threat hunting team. And finally, threat intelligence. It's a bit of an outlier when it comes to our usage of threat intelligence, or certainly our, our function um, as part of the CSOC. It's one of the most public areas of the CSOC where we ingest a huge amount of threat intelligence, including that delivered by our friends in, in, at Microsoft, other commercial partners we have, governmental partners, and our own open source intelligence, and things like that. But essentially, our job is to tell the estate, the National Health Service, what it is they need to be worried about and what they need to do about it. There's so much information out there, and again, that varying level of maturity means our job is to be that, that kind of thought leader. And that can be in strategic products that we put out, we put messaging out, we have a public-facing website we use for often for critical vulnerabilities to inform organizations of specific threats. Um, it can also be tactical intelligence. We feed indicators of compromise into those national services to defend all of the constituent organizations that are part of that. So I told you about the CSOC and who we are. Let's talk a little bit about the NHS. Can I just give a show of hands of anybody who's familiar with the NHS? Excellent, cool. Now, I was familiar with the NHS, and then I worked there, and I understood nothing. It's <laughs> very, very large. It's one of the key things you need to know. It's an absolutely massive organization. It's one of the largest employers in the world. At one stage, it was the, the largest employer in Europe. It continues to be the largest employer in, the, in England. I, I think the most recent count was 1.2 million employees spanning the entire organization. But the way we talk about the NHS can, is a little bit misleading. So even the way I'm referring to it now, the NHS suggests one nice contiguous entity. Big organization, lovely governed, centralized leadership, fantastic. In reality, it looks a little bit more like this. So I mentioned that we're from NHS England. That is one organization within the ecosystem that constitutes the National Health Service, which is this amalgam of all these different organizations. We have sibling organizations in NHS Scotland, NHS Wales, the Health and Social Care in Northern Ireland. And then in amongst all of those organizations are different types of organizations. I talked about GP surgeries and hospitals, but we have NHS foundation trusts, clinical commissioning groups, integrated care systems. If these terms don't make sense to you, they don't make sense to me entirely either, so that's entirely fine. But it's showing the amorphous nature of the, the system. It's an absolutely massive organism of many constituent parts. Then outside of the NHS, strictly speaking, the actual healthcare ecosystem is even larger. We have suppliers, we have arms length bodies like UK Health Security Agency, the UK HSA, or the Department for Health and Social Care, who again, aren't directly part of the NHS, but are part of this ecosystem we, we're a part of as well. So what I mean, why are we speaking to you? We told you a bit about the CSOC, a bit about the NHS. Essentially, it's because it's hard to, to do what we do. Security is hard, full stop. Our job is there to try and minimize harm. Our kind of raison d'etre very much being the WannaCry incident in 2017, kicking off what, what we are now. And it's getting harder. Many of the talks that have been discussed over the past few days, generally speaking, the annual kind of threat intelligence reports that come out around this time of year, 
the scale of the threat is increasing. Checkpoint Research very recently published a report where they said that 74% increase, there was a 74% increase in the average weekly attacks on healthcare organizations between 2021 and 2022. Now, while we can't account for those exact numbers to give you a kind of idea of scale, we, within the CSOC, dealt with over 6,000 incidents in 22 on its own. So those aren't just alerts, those aren't just events, those are fully-fledged incidents, our incident management team is involved. It's nearly 17 a day. So it's, it's busy out there, it, it's getting hard. And because of our scale, because of who we are, the nature of the organization, the things that we're worried about aren't necessarily the, the most frightening things out there. Now, we're absolutely concerned about things like APTs, nation state actors. But fundamentally, the things that pose the most immediate threat to us most of the time are things like commodity malware, things like Quackbot, Emotet, different like, uh, commodity strains that people often dismiss because they're potentially well known or their impact isn't considered as high. But when you're talking about an organization or a service as broad as ours, this hack surface is so large, these things are a present danger every single day. We're seeing these things every single day. Business email compromise. I mentioned we have over a million employees. You can imagine what the attack surface of our email accounts looks like. It is every single day. Those accounts can be compromised, and that could mean sensitive patient information being leaked. That could facilitate a much kind of worse attack, the deployment of ransomware and things like that. Um, but that, again, we're dealing with that every single day. Vulnerabilities. Now, this seems pertinent because we have so many security researchers and people in the room. Vulnerabilities absolutely keep us up at night, but I'd much rather they keep me up at night because you told me about them than us finding them after they've been exploited. But fundamentally, trying to keep on top of the estate, as we talk about it, health and social care estate, understand what our exposure is to vulnerabilities for an organization that is so wide is incredibly difficult to do. We occasionally get bits of kit that we have no idea what it is. We have to understand that, ah, that's some interesting bit of medical IoT. Do we have that? Probably. So let's go and find out what it is. One of my team quips about becoming a rapid expert in pneumatic tubes because there was a vulnerability in a bit of like, um, mechanical kit that we had no idea what it was. We had to go and learn quickly to understand what that exposure. And that ties into what our threat intelligence function does. Supply chain attacks. So just last year, a major supplier to the NHS called Advanced suffered a ransomware attack from, from Lockbit. And that ended up knocking over a number of critical services affecting not just the NHS in England, but in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland as well. That affected NHS 111, which is our non-emergency phone line. So that is up 24 hours a day, and that was knocked over for a considerable period of time. It affected our ability to provide mental health care services. And it's just one example, one recent example, of the way that these cyber incidents can directly impact people and like that human cost of these, these cyber attacks. And this, this is what we're worried about all the time. And finally, ransomware. It doesn't really need much of an introduction. We're absolutely terrified about ransomware because when we get it wrong, if it does go wrong, it's one cry. It's hospitals can't deliver care to patients. It's absolutely the, the top end of the things that we're concerned about. So I mentioned the attack surface, so to put it, quantify it a little bit. So when we're talking about Microsoft Defender for Endpoint Tenant and why we decided to be a little bit brave and say we had the largest one, but we still don't know. Within our Microsoft Defender for Endpoint estate, so we have a national tenant that we share with those healthcare organizations. We have 1.7 million enrolled endpoints within that. That includes just about every flavor of Windows, most of them in support. It's got quite a few different variants of Linux, loads of different types of machines, the kind of amorphous technical estate that we have. Because these organizations aren't necessarily centrally governed. We don't have a central status for this is the only kit that you can use and this is what you will use all the time. They are responsible for most of their own cyber risk. Which means, again, when you're trying to be a central security capability for a decentralized organization, it's an interesting challenge to be able to provide that security. Beyond the 1.7 million we have, so there's 5 million devices we can see. So via device discovery, so just to give you an example of the, the type of thing that we're seeing. Um, and again, when you multiply that by the number of incidents we're seeing for things like Quackbot, it's why these numbers are so, so high. So what do we do about it? How do we actually deal with an attack surface quite so large in an organization where when it does go wrong, it's quite so important? So Microsoft Defender for Endpoint is a major tool in our arsenal for dealing with this. And because we have the national tenant, it's very much double-edged. So obviously we have an enormous attack service, but we can also deploy detections and they're automatically deployed at scale. So every organization is part of that that's using Defender for Endpoint. They benefit from these detections that we build. At the moment, we have a library of 218 custom detections that we have built ourselves that sit alongside um, all of the detections produced by the Microsoft Defender for Endpoint team at Microsoft. Um, we also have 725 auto hunts. So these are essentially a library of advanced hunting queries we've written, we maintain in GitLab. Using our SOAR platform, we deploy those against the Microsoft Defender for Endpoint API. Um, and each morning, our threat hunting team comes in and they see the number of hits we have against each of these things. They're often maybe a bit fuzzier than something that might be able to be a custom detection or a, or a kind of out and out rule. 
um, needs a bit more human eyes on, a bit more um, kind of uh, investigation to, to determine if it's, if it's something. Interestingly, whacking 725 queries into the MD API at one time isn't necessarily advisable. We did, did have a bit of a, an interesting phone call when we're trying to figure out why the performance had taken such a hit and it, a bit of clever scheduling um, and a few conversations later with the, with the product team and we're, we're now cooking with gas the, for the time being at least. So like I say, size is very much double-edged. So our attack surface is absolutely enormous. The responsibility of what we're trying to do is huge. But we can, because of tools like MDE, deploy things at scale. A threat hunt that identifies malicious activity in one organization means an incident. It could mean a detection written and deployed to hundreds of separate organizations within hours of that thing being detected. This is all part of the design principles we've been trying to put in place since WannaCry. Last year, um, the UK government uh, released and updated what they referred to as the um, government cybersecurity strategy between 2022 and 2030. One of the core principles of that strategy is the idea of defending as one. Essentially, what it means is that we're one component, and the government is one component of cybersecurity in the UK. It's an understanding that you can't do it on your own. It's no one entity's responsibility that collectively, if we work together and collaborate um, in many different ways, so press intelligence sharing, all the different ways we can provide guidance and that's kind of technological ways we can integrate, we can actually result in having a disproportionately great impact on security, more than the sum of our parts. Um, and that is very much a kind of core design principle in the CSOC as well, and these things that we're trying to do. So this centralized capability that we are is very much following this idea of defending as one, doing our best to integrate with the complicated ecosystem that we have. Another key weapon we have are high severity alerts. So I'll walk through this quite quickly, but if anyone's familiar with Scissors binding operational directive, it operates in a very similar way. It's one of the ways we directly try to challenge things like WannaCry when it happened. So we'll walk through an example. Something comes in, Intel received, and I love that sentence because it's just so simple. Something comes in the inbox, fantastic, nice package intelligence. Something comes in that we need to know about, we need to assess. Each day, the team meets, we assess what we have, we triage because the volume is incredibly high. Trying to keep on top of anybody who works in the field is, is difficult. Trying to keep on top of cybersecurity every day. But fundamentally, we need to determine what's of the greatest importance, what do we need to do about it? The tricky part is assessing whether or not it's sufficiently high risk to warrant a high severity alert. That means trying to understand, like I said, with vulnerabilities, what's our exposure to this thing? Vulnerabilities are often the most common high severity alerts that we have. It might be a particular piece of software. We know it's being actively exploited. We know it's in common use across the estate. We absolutely need to get this out now. Sometimes that's nice and simple. Sometimes that isn't. Sometimes that's a case of we have no idea what this thing is, where it's used. It's pneumatic tube somewhere. Maybe it's used in every hospital in the world. We don't know. And um, so it's that kind of just in time learning that we have to do and, and understanding and assessing that risk. If we do that at the first stage, gets triaged, gets analyzed, we take it to our CSOC leadership. We say, we think this is sufficiently bad. We make the case has to pass that check. If they agree, yes, this is sufficiently high risk, we absolutely need to take this forward, and then we'll escalate it again. Within one hour of that decision being made, we meet with what's referred to as a joint cyber unit, which is a group of senior stakeholders from organizations spanning not just the NHS, but different organizations as well. Some of the organizations I mentioned before, the UKHSA, um, and organizations like that. Collectively, we make the decision whether or not we need to issue the high severity alert. And what that does, the high severity alert like physically speaking, is actually just a web page. It's just an alert. It goes on our public facing cyber alerts website. It's a summary of the vulnerability, for instance, and what you need to do about it. But when we publish at high severity, what we do is we kick off a background process where organizations are mandated to respond within 48 hours. They need to acknowledge that they've received it and they've read what, what's been sent. After that, they have 14 days to perform the actions dictated in the high severity alert. In most cases, that is, you need to apply this patch or you need to do this six, whatever it is. That is an incredibly powerful weapon when you're talking about scale. So even when I'm talking about the size of our Microsoft Defender endpoint tenant, 1.7 million endpoints, that is not everything. It's not even close. We can see what is in the tenant. We can't see what it isn't. So having a public facing system in this way means we can get out to as many organizations as possible. And because we have this system for mandating a response, we can track what our exposure to this thing is. Because part of what happened during WannaCry is as it was ongoing, it was incredibly difficult to understand where are we at? What is, what is still, what's still happening? few examples of some HSAs that we've issued, um, certainly, certainly not all of them. So SolarWinds, I don't think it needs any introduction, that was absolutely one that had to go out and be dealt with. Log4Shell, Log4J situation, uh, kind of not around this time and earlier last year. I'd love to say that was one HSA that ended up being maybe half a dozen for various products that we had to send out. That was an interesting situation. VMware Workspace One was one of those ones that came, came via Log4Shell. And finally, uh, 
well, this is not even the most recent one, but Proxy Not Shell, Microsoft Exchange, another common example of we need to get this done now. This is potentially being exploited in the wild. We know it's common. We absolutely need to get on top of this. One of the other ways that we interact with organizations in the estate is the delivery of, of tactical threat intelligence. So CSOC indicator, so we use Microsoft Threat Endpoint as an example, because that's a nice, quite an interesting setup. So information comes in, open source intelligence, our own telemetry and investigations, our friends at Microsoft and other kind of um, partners that we have, um, or generally just in the open source. People share things with us. People seem to care about healthcare and it's, it's enormously well received. That comes through, one of two things generally happens. We'll put together a product of some description. So I talked about we communicate to the estate. These are the things you need to be worried about. That might be one thing that we do. If there are specific indicators of compromise, goes into MISP, goes into our Microsoft or Endpoint tenant. Now, where it's interesting is that because we share the tenant with the organizations that we serve, we have global visibility of the entire tenant, but each organization can only see their own. So they have a machine group, for instance, and they can see their own indicators, they can see their own alerts, but they can't see those of other organizations. So we can see them all. So when an alert is actually generated, we see it and they see it, and we're that support, additional layer of support, because those organizations might have dedicated security teams themselves. They might have nobody in place whatsoever, and we're there to pick that up and work with that. What's interesting about indicators in Microsoft Render Endpoint is it's not built to do this especially well. So platform by default, 15,000 indicators you can share. For an individual organization, that might be plenty because that, that rolls through, you know, Microsoft Defender, antivirus picks stuff up. But we're sharing it with hundreds of separate organizations who are using it judiciously. They're absolutely whacking indicators in <laughs> willy-nilly. Um, so we share that with them. We upped it from 15,000, or our friends at Microsoft upped it from 15,000 to 50, and we're already kind of getting towards the end of, a, of that limit as it is. But we're in the, in the process of working on some guidance, potentially some, some features with Microsoft to, to ameliorate that situation. Now, I've talked a lot about the NHS. I've talked about the CSOC. I've set the scene for why it is that we're here and why I'm talking about it, why the problems are so difficult. But to talk to you in a bit more detail about Quackbot and why it poses such an acute threat, I'll hand you off to Mr. Ben McGee. Oh, hello. Right, cool, yeah. Uh, hi, yeah, so I'm Ben. I'm the uh, current threat hunting lead at the, uh, the NHS England CSOC. Um, so I'm just going to do a little bit of a, a dive into one particular element of just one of the threats that Dan mentioned kind of keeps us up at night, um, being QBot, QuackBot, however you guys refer to it here. I'm not entirely sure. I know it also goes by pink slip and BotBot, but we all know what I'm talking about. Uh, and I'll, I'll also come to the, uh, the Ann Twitter uh, reference a little bit later. So I'm not going to... I'm not going to do too much of a deep dive into Qbot itself. I'm pretty sure everyone in this room will know at least what it is. Um, so it kind of started out as a, as a typical standard bank, bank intrusion, similar to the likes of, of TrickBot uh, and Emitet. Um, it was kind of always on our radar as, as you know, one of these commodity malware threats, um, but we only ever saw it in kind of low volume, so it, it never really went any higher than that. Um, we did you know, particularly kind of start to take more notice um, when Qbot began to evolve, so it's, it's moved past that kind of standard bank intrusion phase. Um, it's upped its game with the likes of credential theft, uh, even being able to uh, escalate privileges on a host. Um, we've seen it be able to install a whole host of um, kind of stealthy persistent mechanisms, uh, as well as running um, automated network user and device discovery commands um, on a host, uh, as well as establishing covert C2 channels. So it's progressed. Um, quite rapidly uh, into, into something more than a bank intrusion. So why do we care so much? Um, so as, as Dan alluded to, like in last year alone, uh, we dealt with over 6,000 incidents. Uh, unfortunately, Qbot uh, was great, uh, a, a quite a high percentage of that. Um, but we also saw um, quite high numbers of, of Qbot in general, um, sort of attacks across healthcare. Um, so, and to, to kind of build on that, around like late 2021 is where we started to see a particular surge in Qbot activity um, on our estate. Um, and the reason why we took notice so much is because these, these increased reports were also linked to uh, um, Qbot infections then dropping cobalt strike beacons, um, which kind of gives you the element of they might be being used by the likes of initial access broker groups, um, as well as quite quick turnaround on ransomware deployment um, tied to the... Uh, the, the Black Buster and Mega Cortex groups are, and their affiliates, um, as an example. Obviously, this, this ransomware threat, threat, as Dan alludes to with WannaCry, is kind of why we as the NHS uh, become you know, so worried about that. Um, furthermore, so Qbot in particular, 
when we started seeing the surge in activity, uh, I'll go into it on, on the next slide a little bit more, but we started seeing kind of quite rapid um, and constantly evolving change with their, their TTPs, uh, particularly around payload execution of QBOT. Um, and when we were seeing these, uh, these sort of increased numbers, as well as all the other BAU we have to deal with as a, as a threat operations function in the NHS, things can start to be easily missed. And with that rapid turnaround to ransomware deployment, as I mentioned, we can't really afford to let these things be missed. Um, so for example, we can work all day uh, pushing out new detections or um, coming up with new hunts for these different TTPs, push them out at 5 p.m., log off for the day, and then our NHS staff, our doctors, our nurses, they come in, they work overnight. Um, one of them opens the QBOT payload, it's a brand new payload, um, completely you know, bricks a device or an organization. We wake up the next morning, we've got a whole host of new TTPs and stuff that we have to connect, uh, contend with. So they, yeah, they're just some of the reasons uh, why, why we kind of take so much notice. Uh, so the rise of QBOT as we know it. Um, so to, similar to, to the other ones I mentioned, like TrickBot and Emotet, uh, the kind of standard template was a hijacked email chain um, with an, a macro embedded Excel document, typically using uh, XLM4 uh, template. And the kind of infection chain was always, always the same. Um, getting the user face to face with that document, socially engineering them into um, enabling, uh, enabling content, so enabling the macro. Uh, that macro then calling the URL download to file function uh, to pull down the payload, dropping it into some writable directly, uh, direct directory, um, which typically see program data. Um, and then that same macro can interact with the Win32 API, call on the Reg SVR32 uh, executable to, um, to, to basically execute that payload. That was kind of the same template for, for most of these banking trojans. Um, and the hunting opportunity there was always kind of the same. Um, it was basically just looking for XL.exe as the parent and uh, registryr 32 as the child. And that would kind of always whittle out uh, the bad behavior. So again, it wasn't much of, too much of a threat to us at this point. Um, around January 2022 is where we kind of started to see these slight, very slight changes in the QBot malware. So with this, if, uh, if there are any malware analysts here, like if you know, you know with this kind of thing, but the changes were very, very slight. So instead of dropping the payload into uh, the C program data directory, they would add in a new custom directory, a layer deeper. Um, there's a couple of examples there, Jambo, Bambo. Um, they kind of just went through different iterations, sometimes only changing one letter. Um, which again, a really like menial thing, but it requires changes to, to the hunt to be able to pick it up. Um, as well as that, so we'd also see different uh, payload file extensions. So it was typically .dlls, but this uh, also changed to .ocxs and .dats. Um, so again, these kind of small changes, but uh, they represent a, a very real change that we have to introduce. Um, so yeah, just after this uh, is where, so I think it was around February, um, uh, where Microsoft introduced Mark of the Web to try and get ahead of this. So Mark of the Web um, basically being a concept to block any uh, macro-enabled documents downloaded from the internet from being able to run, which is a really good, a really good move. But as was aptly predicted by quite a high number of uh, security researchers in the malware analysis field, um, they, they basically said, well, Qbot are going to quite quickly look for a new solution, a new recipe as to how to get around that, which they did. They, we saw quite, quite quickly off, uh, off the bat a shift to different living off the land binaries, so stuff like PowerShell, uh, curl, WScript, different iterations, and, and loads more that I haven't listed, um, to try and pull down from the dropper, try and pull down that payload and run it. Um, so this is kind of where we started to face challenges, right? Because not only were these, um, these numbers so high, but they're also changing every single day almost. Um, and this, this is where I put Twitter to the rescue. So Twitter came through. Quite, uh, quite well for us. So, around this time, also we, we were kind of quite thin on the ground. As Dan mentioned, we've like we've progressed in CSOC to having really good numbers. But around this time, we were sort of in between contract renewals and permanent staff recruitment. As I think someone mentioned yesterday, the the, the uh, cyber skills gap very real for for us as well. Um, so we we had to sort of revert to open source um, intelligence for quite a lot of the quite a lot of the time. And uh, there was a few um, security researchers that I'll shout out. Uh, that don't, I mean, there's loads more that I can't think off the top of my head, but uh, the likes of Max Mal, um, Execute Malware, Proxy Life, these guys were also seeing um, these, these heavy volumes of QBot and they were posting daily updates to their Twitter feeds, uh, their GitHub repos of indicators, and particularly highlighting the, the shift in tactics each time. 
um, which was absolutely invaluable to us. Uh, that it was like having someone else sat next to us in the CSOC. Um, really, really useful and invaluable in us getting ahead of the curve and, and stopping these attacks. That being said, we did still face detection challenges, as, as everyone will, will have done that was uh, trying, to get, trying to fight this Qbot uh, threat, um, particularly when to try and get around Mark of the Web bypass, uh, sorry, to, to try and bypass Mark of the Web. Um, we also saw from the hijacked email chains, instead of just being the Excel file dropped into the email, we'd start to see HTML smuggling. I've got an example on the next slide. Um, but this is basically instead of, yeah, as I said, instead of that Excel file, it's a HTML link as an attachment, uh, which takes the user to uh, a, a download page for a, a password protected .zip file uh, with the payload actually in that. So those layers are kind of how um, Qbot got around Mark of the Web uh, fairly quickly. Um, so yeah, as I've said there, you've got the path at the bottom. So a .zip, uh, they found their niche in the use of ISO files, um, and then a link shortcut to then download that DLL. Those steps are kind of how they got around it, um, which was a very real and very difficult challenge that we faced for detection. Here I've got an example. You probably can't see it uh, particularly well. Is my pointer work? Yeah, so here we can see uh, legitimate email traffic referencing uh, a patient survey of some kind uh, and the hijacked um, email body here. So we've got the HTML uh, attachment and a reference to a password, ABC123, really great password. Um, but the user would then uh, double click that HTML link, go to the zip download page, put in the password, and hey presto, the payload's on their device. So our approach to this, so um, I've kind of branched out into, into three main um, processes that, that we took um, at the NHS to, to try and get ahead of this one threat. Um, first being proactive, broad hunting at scale. So using all that data that we've got across those 1.7 million endpoints, um, and coming up with hypotheses, uh, hypotheses uh, that we can then use and, and kind of hone in on the bad. So ISO files as an example, um, virtual disk images, absolutely huge files typically used to like spin up VMs and stuff. Um, so it's very rare that you would get a small uh, ISO file. And these Qbot ISO files were very small because they only contained the payload DLL and a couple of other useless files. So they were a couple of megs max in size versus the likes of 10, 15, 50 gigabytes um, for an ISO file. So there we can, you know, we can set the scope and we can, uh, we can hone in on it a little bit. And quite simply, just looking for ISO files running on a desktop, um, you'd only really ever see that if someone is trying to spin up a, a VM on, the, on their local machine. Um, but then you've got, you can kind of hone in on what a legitimate VM name would be, um, aptly sort of like following um, just typical operating system names. Um, so looking for that, those ISO file executions on the desktop rather than a server kind of um, separates the good and the bad a, a little bit. Um, yeah, so hunting by least frequency um, kind of says what it is on the tin. But as an example, I talked about Red SVR 32 executing the, the payload. Um, just doing a simple search on what a legitimate process command line looks like for that binary, um, getting a nice baseline of what legitimate is getting rid of all that, and then picking out the anomalous stuff there. Um, and then in yeah, a similar vein, anomalous behavior from virtual drives. So when an ISO file is mounted, a uh, virtual drive is mounted. Um, and then you can start to kind of look at what might be odd. So you know, random DLLs just being spun up from a virtual drive, for example. Uh, secondly, so time frame based hunts. So particularly with um, the shift to HTML smuggling and uh, mark of the web, uh, sorry, yeah, mark of the web bypass and and the use of things like ISO files to get around the use of um, using macro-enabled documents. Um, we can take these like key events in the infection chain that on their own are, are normal, but when you put them together uh, in sequential order within a really small window, so like a minute or two minutes, you can kind of whittle out the bad behavior again. So a user interacting with their Outlook browser, uh, sorry, their Outlook client on their, on their desktop, some kind of HTML file interaction event, um, pretty, pretty atypical. Uh, and then an ISO drive being mounted on that on that same desktop. If you look for that, those events in that order within the space of a couple of minutes, uh, it's a pretty good indicator of, of, of Qbot or malware in general. And then building on that, so looking for maybe an ISO file being mounted, and then a couple of seconds later or even a minute later, weird DLL names start to be chucked up on that desktop as well. Seeing that in the EDR logs um, in that order is, is, again, another good indicator that we can use. And finally, the kind of bread and butter of of threat hunting, anyone who's like trying to get into threat hunting, 
this is the concept that I'd, I'd point you at first, is looking for weird parent-child process relationships. So again, I'll, I'll go back to the example of Regis VR32. Um, you can, even across the biggest estate, you can baseline what a normal child process might be for Regis VR32, because it's pretty similar in its behavior uh, in the operating system. Um, and then you can whittle out, again, the bad, like the, the anomalous uh, child processes. And, and similarly, Regis VR32 being the, the kind of beachhead process that Qbot uses, uh, it also injects into different processes, uh, maps the memory of different processes. So you can, again, baseline that activity. So here we've got an example, apologies again for the incredibly small text, uh, but we've got a Microsoft Defender for Endpoint timeline with the Q active Qbot infection on it. So the highlighted event is Regis VR32 injecting into uh, the Windows Zero Reporting Manager process. Uh, and then here we can drill down a little bit more, so we can see at the top of that chain is WScript running a Windows script file uh, from a virtual drive, so again what I talked about. Um, and then in the top right, we've got just like a kind of quick and easy hunt that we might do for this. So again, uh, pointing back to that parent-child uh, process relationship, we've got uh, the parent being Regis VR32, the child being Windows Zero Reporting Manager, and then you can also kind of narrow that down by looking for particular device event uh, types, such as with this one being uh, like memory mapping into that child process. Next, so here on this particular timeline, we can see that we've got uh, one of our custom detections and then not to throw any shade on uh, the Microsoft Defender for Endpoint team, they've only put possible uh, crackbot activity, we've put it definitely is. Um, but yeah, again, we can, uh, we can hone on it a little bit more um, with the information here. With this particular uh, query that I've thrown up, this is, again, the, the process relationships, but we've gone for the grandfather parent being Regis VR32. Um, the reason being is that we, we quite often saw that injected process, that next layer, the child of Regis VR32 change quite a lot. Um, they just went through a phase of, of using different Windows binaries, um, but the trial then was always the same, so they'd use, they'd use that injected process to run their discovery. So we can actually afford to do a good hunt and look for this without needing to know what that middle layer is. And lastly, um, so the second, uh, second stage payload um, being dropped on the host. So with this one, it's basically the same thing where we're looking for the grandparent being Regis VR32. Um, but with this one, we don't, we don't know what that, what that um, final payload uh, is going to look like. We just know it's going to be a DLL. So we can say that the file name ends with DLL. But one thing that we did see that was consistent was that it's dropped into the app data roaming directory. Um, again, quite trivial for them to change, but they never seem to, um, which is why we, we can specify that the final folder path has that uh, as the parameters. And lastly, I couldn't do a talk at a Microsoft conference without shouting out how great Microsoft are. Um, so here we've got an example of uh, one of the more recent uh, Qbot infections. So OneNote dropping um, uh, embedded HTA files in order to execute the payload. This is kind of the, the golden template. This is the end game that we want to reach across our estate. We want to see you know, that initial dropper coming in and ASR successfully blocking it. So in particular, this rule uh, blocking office applications from creating child processes. Unfortunately, it's just not realistic, it's not feasible uh, across an organization as big as ours. As Dan said, we've got huge trusts with massive security teams that have the, the skills and the infrastructure to put this in place. We also have GP surgeries with one tech guy that, you know, he knows how to turn it on and that's about it. Um, so we, we can't rely on this, which I guess kind of highlights what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to get across here is that Whilst ASR might always, you know, might kind of, um, it won't exactly chuck us out of a job, but it'll mean I have more time to answer emails and attend pointless meetings. Um, but it, it, we're always going to kind of need that proactive threat hunting to get across, um, sorry, to get ahead of a threat that, you know, might seem quite basic, but is very real to us. So, yeah, thank you. So, we we'll talked to you a lot about the NHS about CSOC, about Quackbot, to illustrate the types of threats that we're dealing with and the challenges associated with doing it at our kind of scale. There's a little bit of irony about complaining to Microsoft, of all companies, about dealing with security at scale, but still, we have a unique set of challenges. Fundamentally, what are we doing next? The fight isn't over. It may never truly be over. So what are we doing to develop and to, to better deal with these threats in the future? In the interest of time, I'll skip through this one. This is largely talking about the way we're developing our, our kind of threat-led capabilities, very much where we're doing. We're trying to arm our analysts and our teams to better serve organizations in, in, in the healthcare estate. and includes things like developing dedicated labs in Azure. 
to allow our threat hunters to have detection labs to identify ways of, of doing this stuff and more proactively looking at things like that, dealing with vulnerabilities and understanding exposure or, or testing POCs, things of that nature. Expanding our threat intelligence function, things, things like that is very much a, a key aspect of our, of our kind of short, medium term plan. At a slightly higher level, the future. So we talked about Defenders 1, this key principle that comes from the government cybersecurity strategy, but also just a key ethos within the CSOC and about what it is we're trying to do. So we as a healthcare ecosystem within the UK and what it is we're trying to do. We're trying to, to do it better, understanding our place as a one piece of apparatus in the broader healthcare ecosystem, working with our kind of sibling organisations in, in NHS Scotland, NHS Wales, um, Health and Social Care in Northern Ireland working with organisations on the ground, understanding what it is they need from us, the support we can actually offer, and doing more work with our commercial partners and other government organisations as well to, to better defend ourselves together. Because again, collectively, we can be greater than the sum of our parts independently. A key aspect of that work is threat intelligence. So we do term it threat intelligence, but it, but it has an interesting job in that we're often relaying key intelligence rather than, than producing it. So, so we get a lot of information from the likes of Microsoft and other organisations and then we're taking that, digesting it, analysing that, and putting that to the right people to understand, so they can understand what it is they need to be worried about. Fundamentally, to do that effectively, you need to understand what those requirements are. What is it they need from us, again? What intelligence can we provide? Because it's easy from our perspective to put stuff out that might be interesting. But is it of material value? Can it actually do something for them in a tangible way? Um, and actually, again, help them do their jobs better? Because fundamentally, again, we're there to reduce harm. We're there to allow healthcare organisations to do their job safely. And lastly, proactive defence. So as um, Ben was talking, he demonstrated with the, the ASR reduction rule. We're trying to, to get better collectively to advise on the ways that we can shrink our attack surface. So using some of our central visibility that we have through tools like Microsoft Defender for Endpoint and those are national services. Identify where are we weak? Where can we strengthen ourselves? Not only identify and respond, which is very much the, the kind of bread and butter of the SOC, but where can we actually advise on how we can shrink that attack surface and be more secure as a whole? So that involves things like identifying legacy IT, trying to avoid another WannaCry situation. That involves identifying our exposure to critical vulnerabilities, internet-facing infrastructure, and doing more work in that space and working with regional leaders and kind of um, IT teams, again, on the ground at these organizations to shrink that attack surface. And I've, generally speaking, increase the, the overarching security. Now, just as I wrap up, because the numbers are going down very quickly on this time here, there's a couple of thank yous I wanted to, to express. So firstly, to Blue Hat for inviting us to come. It's a bit of an odd talk, this one, I think, among an incredibly elevated company, both yourselves and the incredible speakers that have been on the past couple of days. And it's a very unique opportunity for us to, to express like, what, what it is that we do and some of the challenges that we face, certainly in healthcare and, again, in, in the UK. But secondly, to you, to the security community. So a lot of talk over the past few days have talked about communities, talked about the value of security researchers. And as Ben has kind of discussed on the way through, the work that you do day to day, security researchers identifying vulnerabilities and disclosing them responsibly to organizations so we can get in front of them before attackers do, before they're exploited against us. People openly sharing indicators of compromise, TTPs, detections even on things like Twitter. Those are having a tangible effect on our ability to reduce harm to the NHS in the UK. The work that you do every single day is having a material benefit to our ability to keep patients safe. So on behalf of the NHS, the CSOC, and healthcare in the UK, thank you. And thank you very much for your time.